What's up, good people? Welcome to this episode of the By the Hood podcast slash webcast, because I don't know how you're consuming this content. Um, bringing another uh, amazing episode with you. We have another uh, entrepreneur, another brother in the building. And this guy right here, man, um, he's an entrepreneur in a space that, you know, is not too many of us in. So I definitely want to highlight what he's doing, what he has going on. Um, you know, family, man. I, I see him online posting about his family and talking about his business. So I definitely want to invite him on and have him share what's going on. So without further ado, you know, um, I want to introduce our guest. My brother Corey's in the building as well. But I want to introduce our guest before we... Uh, you have a deep dive into what exactly it is he does because I want to let him explain it to you guys. We have Robert from Brewing Feed in the building. Rob, how are you? Good, doing good. Yeah, uh, just a quick, quick uh, introduction of myself um, of what I'm doing as far as Brewing Feed. Brewing Feed is basically a craft brewery, craft beer, and healthy eating lifestyle brand. I created it because um, I spent 10, 11, 12 years brewing beer at home and decided to take that skill set and monetize it. Um, but on the way to that journey, because it's a lot of capital investment, I started selling hot sauces and spice mixes online, just trying to understand the e-commerce world, get that under my belt. Um, and then I said, I want to go ahead and start a craft beer brand. So craft beer is a huge business. Um, there's a lot of people, uh, a lot of businesses that are in it, but it's not a lot of uh, minorities in it. Yeah. There's an underground movement of African Americans that are creating craft beer brands right now, though. In fact, there's a festival coming up in August of all black craft beer brands in Pittsburgh, uh, August 10th. It's called okay. the Fresh Fest Beer Fest. Yeah, that's dope. Any specific reason they're doing it in Pittsburgh? The, 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 the people that run it are in Pittsburgh. The two brothers that run it, they have a podcast called Partners. I think it's called Partners Pod or Drinking Partners Pod, something like that. But that's their home location. Yeah, that's their home location. They're two comedians, and they uh, they got a podcast that's pretty funny, and they uh, do a lot of stuff with craft beer. Okay. So that's why. All right, yeah. so I'm, I'm going to ask you a couple more questions about your specific business. But before we get into that, can you give our uh, listeners a little bit about your background, like uh, where did you go to school, how far did you reach in school, and, and things of that nature? Yeah, I, uh, I grew up here in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, East Cleveland, Ohio, to be specific. It's a separate city from Cleveland, uh, Shaw High School. Graduated from high school and went into the military, spent nine years in the U.S. Air Force, traveled around the world, um, all around the country, did around the world, Turkey, Spain, Italy, um, came back to the U.S. Um, and finished up a bachelor's degree at Campbell University down in Bowie's Creek, North Carolina. Um, did that, actually did that four-year degree in three years. So I kind of crushed a bunch of classes in. Uh, the instructors will come down to the military base and train us and give us our classes in a short eight-week session. You had the same amount of hours I was compressing eight weeks. Finished up a bachelor's degree and decided I'm getting out of the Air Force. Um, and when I got out of the Air Force, I went into IT consulting um, was my first job. Well, that's what I'm, I'm still doing that now. That's basically my career. My main corporate gig is IT consulting. Okay. Then I moved back to Ohio went and got a master's degree in business. Um, and then my management career in IT consultant took off from there. Um, it's, there's kind of a relationship between that and the craft beer, because when I went into management, mm -hmm. I started doing a lot. It was all spreadsheets and numbers and, and managing people. It had nothing to do with what I went to. I went into IT because I was a computer programmer. Okay. I was a hard, I was, I had like seven to eight different programming languages under my belt. Um, and when I got away from that, I got away from like the creative part of it. Long story short, my wife bought me a homebrew kit and I got into the details of it, the science of it, the biology of it, and just went crazy from there. Nice. So I have a couple of questions based on that. So you're an MBA, like you just said. That's right. I'm going to get back to that in a second, but you said something in the beginning. You said East Cleveland is different from Cleveland, right? And yeah. I learned about that listening to the serial podcast. So. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much truth was in that, but I, uh, you know, I'm going to co-sign you based upon cereal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, also, with you being an MBA, right? So I want to ask you a question about education. And we asked a lot of our guests this just because of uh, all the controversy regarding the student loan debt crisis mm -hmm. in the country. Um, you obviously, it's, it's giving you a platform and, and you, you, just, you just already said how it's helped you do what you're doing now. But overall, um, do you look at education any different now than you did when you went to get your uh, bachelor's and your MBA? 
Like, would you, would you advise, like, if you have kids that are going to college, how would you advise them considering the cost of college now and how the loans are structured? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot different. Um, globalization is the biggest elephant in the room. You have to know what you're getting yourself into when you graduate with that degree. If you're, if you're, whatever you're getting your degree in has been commoditized and moved overseas, don't, I wouldn't advise going into that career field because I, I, as an IT consultant, I solution and I see how these deals come together and the, the, how much they're paying these folks versus how much we need in order just to basically have a decent career here is, is pennies. They're not, they're, not make, they're not making that much money over there. It's a lot for them in their economy, but not here. So know what your career field is when you go into it and what, what it looks like relative to the global market. Um, it, you want something that, where you physically have to be here in the U.S. to do that work, especially if you're going into technology. Okay, that's a good point. Corey, you got anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, uh, with your education, um, how did it affect your, uh, the way that you see uh, your business? Like, you said that you, you went into IT, and then when they put you in management, it changed over everything. So how did it affect how you, you know, structured your business? Yeah, that's a good question. I, there's a lot of things. I work with a lot of entrepreneurs in doing this, and there's a lot of things you don't learn in school. You just got to go and make those mistakes. Um, but I did, I am using a lot of the stuff I did in school in my current job, and a lot of it is applicable to this. I mean, so, I wanted to ask you, uh, is it more about what you know or who you know in, in your current uh, setup? Yeah, so the, in, in, in my corporate gig, it's about what you know, because people have a spreadsheet that lists the skill sets, and they need to fill those roles. And so that's why it's important when you get a degree, you got to know what that spreadsheet, spreadsheet looks like in that industry and what they're paying. In this job... You don't have to. You don't have to know everything. Knowing the right people, I, I watch entrepreneurs and how they move. They don't pay full price for stuff. They they get relationships and opportunities based on who they know, not how much money they got. So it's a different world. Where entrepreneurship. That's why I'm dipping my toe in. I'm easing my way into it now because I know that while a lot of the stuff that I learned in school and the stuff I had in business and in, in the corporate world is good stuff to know. Being in the entrepreneurship world is a completely different ball game. Interesting. Okay, interesting. So um, I've seen what you've created with Blue and Feed. Um, and, you know, first of all, kudos to you. Because the one thing I can say is, like, you, you have products, but you're media. You have a media company at this point. That's and right. So, who yeah. does your editing? You have, like, amazing editing on your videos. Is that you? So that's me. So that's, that's um, one of the things that I learned from corporate world when I was, as a technologist, I understand how technology works, how software works, and I can figure things out fairly quickly. And I have, a, I have an account with a, a website called lynda.com. It's L-Y-N-D-A.com. Education. I've, I've, I've yeah. Been. I just go in there. I, hit, I put up a course, and I hit the treadmill, and I watch the course, and I learn how to edit video and shoot video and and produce video all from that website. Okay, I, you know what? That's 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 a for those who are listening or watching, you may want to write a great that. resource. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. You know, self education, like you know, um, you, you're still learning, although you're building. You're learning while you're building. That's right. I clicked on one of your videos the other day, and you were like talking to yourself. You had like, I'm like, this, yeah, you're taking it to another level with it. With yeah, this. I cloned myself. I made three of me. Actually, I'm I'm working on a series where I don't know if you know, but I had a a sci-fi mini series that I did and now I'm going to do another one that's going to be about the clones and how you know how that how that all works and everything yeah so, <laughs> um, so you have media um you know but you also at this point have products you have a cookbook you have um like spices and, mm -hmm. and you went through the process of getting things um you know a trademark all right that's right Mm -hmm. Now, um, for the for the people listening that are like you know thinking about having something trademarked, they're going through that process. Um, how would you describe that process? Easy, grueling, tough? What is the process of getting something trademarked for those who have you know something in mind they want to uh, go through? That? Yeah, definitely do it, um, especially if you got something unique. But it takes a long time, and it's not because you're doing anything. The the trademark office just has 
a huge backlog and it takes a long time to get your stuff approved. So I'm talking, I'm talking think six, seven, eight months out to when you need to have a trademark versus when you need to apply for it. But the paperwork is easy. I have a lawyer, so I just had them work up the paperwork, but looking at the paperwork, I could have did it myself. Okay. Um, but you, when you apply for a trademark, there's no guarantee you're going to get it. One of mine's got rejected because it was, it had the word feed in it. And one of the other web, the website that has a company called feed, they had, they sell, um, drinkware and they sell like one, one mug and I sell drinkware. So my drinkware request got rejected because they sell drinkware, even though our companies have nothing in common, this is the, but, but the word feed. So realize it, it's going to cost you, you know, 150, 200 bucks per trademark if you're going through a lawyer because they get their fees. But um, you got to apply for a trademark for every product. You don't just apply for one trademark for your whole company. If you if you have a company, you're selling T-shirts, if you're selling um, any kind of apparel, drinkware, housewares, you have to apply in those various different categories. So that's 200 bucks per pop for every one you apply for. Okay. Okay. So now yeah. with that being said, as you're building this thing out and um. I I see you, you you've already um come a long way in a short period of time. Um would you what would be your advice for uh, up and coming entrepreneurs? It's like get one product and build that out. Like because you don't want to sit around and try to trademark five, ten things when you don't have one thing selling as of yet, right? So would in my opinion, just like from the outside looking in, um and again I'm in a whole different business, but would you just suggest find that one product that works and trademark that and try to see what you could do with that? Yeah, if you're if you're building it yourself, I'm able to expand into multiple different products because, because being, in the out, being, being in IT outsourcing, I basically do a lot of outsourcing work. Okay. I've outsourced the blending of my spice mixes, the creation of my hot sauce. They, they label my product for me. I've outsourced these things. So I, that gives me time to do the, the crazy videos and the, the marketing and the stuff that I do. It frees my time up to do that part. But if you're creating the product yourself don't overwhelm yourself stick with one product and get it out there especially if you got to do the marketing and everything as well all right so you said a couple of things right there i gotta expound upon um and corey jump in whenever you want to but yeah yeah i'm, I'm i wanted to jump in but you you talk and i want you to go ahead okay, first you, know, and then. you mentioned the value of your time right and you know me and corey have a book on your time and space and Corey talks a lot about the value of your time and, mm -hmm. and one of the things that people ask me all the time right so even in a real estate business, a lot of people, um, when dealing with leads and things, I get a lot of questions about how to outsource that. Um, and people are, you know, a lot of people have read the, uh, you know, four hour work week. So they get on this whole ride of, I want to outsource, read that. <laughs> I want to outsource everything. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everybody who listens, you know, you love books and you always mention books, but, um, everybody wants to outsource everything. And you said that you've kind of figured that part out. Can you talk to us a little bit about, um, your process and outsourcing, how you find someone to outsource a specific task to? Is it a service you use or? Yeah, I, 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 um, I went online, Google search, find, find some people that might do what I do, give them a call, see if they're reputable. And then if you, if you have somebody outsource something for you, definitely have them blend your product. But like the spice mix company that I use, some of the blends that I do were their blends because they were similar to something I had when I said, well, just use yours. And some, and some of the blends that I'm going to be marketing here soon are going to be my own blends. Well, um, definitely have them do that work for you and send you samples to see how good they are. Um, you don't want to get caught in a situation where you're dealing with an unreputable uh, vendor. Also, make sure that pricing, because they're going to they're get a cut uh, of that. So, and they're going to give you pricing based on how much you buy. So my spice mix blender, for example, the more I buy, the cheaper they sell it to me for, but the more product I got to move. So there's a balance that I got there. So, uh, at, so you're not drop shipping it. You're actually getting it blended and send it to you. And then you have to actually sell it. Or right. how was that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Some of my products are drop ship. Some of them are like the spice mix and the hot sauce. I have to inventory those myself and ship them myself. Okay. All right. Interesting. So yeah. that's a lot, a lot of game right there. If you people are listening, like, you know, um, and I like to always go back and reiterate some of the points that our guests are making because I'm learning myself as you guys talk. So one of the re another reasons I always say this while we start the show is because I like to learn too. And you talked about the value of your time, um, how to outsource and that's, you know, outsourcing helps you free more time, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. 
So what do you see as the future for, um, for Brew and Feed? What do you, what do you see as the future? Um, anything different than what you're currently doing or adding more products, more media? What do you see? I'm going to stick with the products. There's a couple of things that I'm thinking about in the future. I'm actually set in motion. Um, it's the, 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 I'm trying to be different than the other craft beer companies. I'm also trying to tap into a higher growth market. Overall, craft beer um, is, is, was doing really well relative to macro beer. Macro beer is your Budweiser's and your Miller Lights. Craft beer is your small local brewery. There's several of them there, probably in your area. Um, their growth rate has started to slow, but the ones that have food associated with the beer, their growth rate is actually still at about 13% growth rate. So I'm trying to tap into that growth rate market and I'm trying to be different with helping people make healthier choices when they drink beer. People are going to drink beer, they're going to enjoy it. But if you, if you, if you eat that 14 ounce steak and, and eat all of that other stuff with it, and then you pound back four or five craft beers, which are higher in alcohol, more rich, flavorful, you've now consumed a lot of empty calories. I'm trying to educate people that when you drink beer, consider it as part of the, min as part of the meal and then in its totality and make a good decision. Do you have educational products around that or are you just uh, doing it as part of your marketing and promotion? Yeah, so my, that's right. I'm doing it as part of my marketing promotion. So I do things like I tell people to work out. I, 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 on my social media, I talk about my bike riding, exercising. Um, I talk about the, the, the importance of drinking lower ABV beers. If you're going to, some people like to drink beer every day. Well, you can't drink an eight, nine, 10% beer every day. It's like drinking malt liquor. <laughs> you can't do that every day. It's going to catch up with you at some point. So I want my consumers to survive because I want to sell them beer until they old and gray. I don't want them to <laughs> consume my product and then and then pass yeah. and croak, right? Yeah, so I, I watched the, uh, a documentary called The, the Truth About Alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I would uh, suggest that our, our listeners look at that. And also, um, they were saying a lot of the things that you were saying about the ABV and things like that. That's a um, very good uh, documentary on Netflix, The Truth About Alcohol, if you want to learn something about alcohol and the uh, effects of alcohol on the body. Um, yeah, let's keep it real. We're drink, we're brew, I'm brewing beer that has alcohol in it. <laughs> and it's an adult product and it's meant to be consumed in moderation. Um, and, and so I understand that. And so I'm, I have to, actually the government requires me to be responsible with who and how I advertise that product. Um, so that's, so with respect to where I want to go next, I want to brew more beer. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to brew more beer, more variety, or bring stuff to the market. And in order to do that, I set up another relationship that's fairly unique. It's not fully outsourcing because I'm going to be doing the beer, but what I set up what the government calls is an alternating proprietorship with, a, with an existing brewery. But it still requires me to be a fully licensed brewer with all of the stuff that a brewer would do, but I don't have the capital expenditure. So they, I, do have, I do have to make some form of investment into their brewery um, to, do this, to have this relationship work. And then I have to pay my rent and all that stuff but basically, I'm considered a tenant brewer on a larger brewer, brew house. Mm. And people say, well, you can just drop some money and create your own brewery. I'd have to drop my corporate gig and do that full time. But like we were talking about with your time, it allows me to tap into a resource that's already existing without having to work, go through the build out and commit to a capital expenditure by quitting my corporate job and then, then being a steward and main, maintaining that, that, that hardware. Listen, you, you, you've given a lot of gems. Yeah, you, you're right? dropping gems.com. Yeah. Yeah. About, <laughs> about partnering um, with, with this, uh, you know, companies that already have infrastructure built. And you also said something else that was interesting about, um, you know, how you're building your business, right? So you're, you're building this from the ground up. You're taking it slow. Um, and mm -hmm. that, that partnership is a major key. But you also talked about your data and knowing your target market. I could tell you, I could tell you an NBA just by the way you talk. <laughs> Capital expenditures, and he's talking about right. target market. So yeah. I, I, could, I could tell that you're an NBA because, uh, you know, those are NBA terms. But, um, but, but that's, that's all, all, all good information, though, about, you know, how, how to use your time wisely, how to use resources wisely. Find, you said you found people that were already in the business, and you literally picked the phone up and called them, right? So that's another gem. Like, 
you, you have to get up and do something. Nothing's going to come to you. You're out here hustling, more or less. Um, mm-hmm. Man, so that's all inspiring. So now you told us about the future of your company. What about the future of craft beer overall? You already said that in terms of um, you know, African Americans, there's, there's like a swell up in the underground that people get into, you know, it's culture, so to speak. It's more or less a culture. Mm-hmm. Um, do you see that continuing to happen? Yeah, because the, I think what's happening in the market, there's, a, there's an organization called the Brewers Association, and they've recognized that in order to grow the market, they're going to have to um, tap into other, um, minor, other groups of people that don't consume their beer. Um, more women, more minorities, whether it be Hispanic or African American. Um, and there's a lot of people that are advocating for that. In fact, they just hired a... Um, um, a person that managed their diversity program and they have a grant that they do every year where they, they give, they, they, they give money to people who are going to have events where they're going to promote craft beer to minorities. Now, one of the things that we've done, if you look at a lot of the craft beer, the African American craft beer, we don't want to turn craft beer into slit small liquor. Mm-hmm. We, right. And that's why you have guys like me that are talking about beer as a higher, you, I want people to think of beer like wine or some exotic drink, not something you chug and get drunk off of, but something you, I mean, if you choose to do that, you're an adult, but my thing is enjoy it responsibly um, and, um, and, and, and in moderation. There is a, there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a couple of, there's, there's a brother and a sister out in um, California who are building a brewery out in Inglewood, California. And if you're familiar with Inglewood, it's similar to what they did in Brooklyn. It's turning into a, yeah. I don't like to use the word gentrification, but it, they're bring, in, this, in that scenario because they're, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, a, it's yeah, it's, I don't know, because I don't know the situation if they're kicking people out or raising rents, but I know they're building up Inglewood. And he's, he's got a brand called, it used to be called Dope and Dank, but it's now called Crowns and Hops. Um, and we've exchanged information about how we might be able to collaborate in the future, but and he just went through a funding campaign where he raised, I think, 60 or 70,000 bucks. I think he got some funding from a bigger brewery um, as a part of a competition he was in. Um, so he set the stage. He's probably one of the leaders. Well, it's, it's, it's actually the marketing genius behind his woman named Benny, um, and T.O. Hunter is the other gentleman who, who uh, he's the kind of the personality behind it all. Okay. Um, they know their stuff. So you see people like that. If you check out their social media, you'll see what he's doing and you'll see the people that are following him. They're all, there's a whole bunch of us underground folks that are trying to build these black craft beer. There's one, in, there's one more, there's one in Harlem called the Harlem Brewery. Mm-hmm. Um, that woman has distribution in Walmart. She just built another brewery in, um, somewhere in North Carolina. Um, and she's been doing it for a while too. Okay. Now- so yeah. I have, a, I have a question, and, I, and this is something I've been thinking about. I was actually pondering this earlier when I knew, when I knew you were coming on. I said, this is a question I have to ask you because I get into these debates with other entrepreneurs and, um, um, and, and people who are in business, right? So you mentioned about the, uh, the person you were just speaking of getting funding from another brewery. Mm-hmm. You also mentioned someone who got theirs within Walmart. Mm-hmm. Um, so within our community, there's always been a debate when you have um, a product or a brand what do you do when the big brand when the big brands come to acquire you, right? Uh, as mm-hmm. a as a black owned business, do you sell, or do you try to hold it on as a black owned business for as long as possible? So let's just say, for argument's sake, one of the big boys came, the Budweisers came, and they said, "We love what you're doing. We want to acquire your company." What is your thought process? Do you do you sell? Do you, you know, like how do you see those trends? Like I, I saw this happen with uh, Tristan Walker and Bevel. I saw it happen when B when back to right when Robert Johnson sold BET, right? Yeah. Like, I saw people congratulate him and some said, "Oh, you should have kept that black." Or um, Carol's daughter was another one. I can go on and on. Yeah, yeah. Every, <laughs> every time it happens, I see this debate. What is your perspective on that? Well, I, I'll just quick, real quick on the Robert Johnson thing is Robert Johnson took his money and started a bank, so it was yeah, a means to an end for him. He yeah. also has a, he also has an online service that I subscribe to called Urban Movie Channel, mm-hmm. where he's where you can go and subscribe and watch all of these black movies. I mean, he, so, also, he also owns a real estate investment trust. Um, yeah, so it, it, it was a means. To, but yeah, I get that. I get that. At the end of the day, a business is a means to an end for people to 
to do something else with. It's, it's just a, it's a, it's a vehicle. I, I, I have this debate in my head and with people too. Um, you can be a black business that sells products to the black community, or you can be a business that sells product to whoever. Um, but when it comes to your business, at some point you're going to time out in the craft beer world. It's frowned, it's frowned upon for a craft brewery to sell out to a larger brand. Okay. It, you, you will actually have people revolt and stop drinking your beer, which has, ha which has happened to a lot of these breweries that have sold out. Um, a good, there's a couple of good examples of this out there, but there's a company called Wicked Weed that's based in Asheville. They came out of nowhere. They had all this funding. They make they, amazing beer. Some of, the, some of my favorite beers are made by them, but they, they sold out to AB InBev for $100 million. I mean, I hate to play it, but you can't hate the game. A hundred million dollars. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, but 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 they but they still have people that go there. They're just not educated on you shooting yourself in the foot when a big brand buys your company because they're not acting in your best interest. So, it's the same thing. So it depends upon the industry you're saying as well, right? Yeah. But at the same time, if you cash out for a hundred million, you don't care what they. Yeah. What they you time out. You, you, you and your business will time out at some point because the, if you're doing something that's that good, that's that valuable, you gotta, your company's going to reach a point where I can't really grow this business anymore unless I get a huge capital investment. In a craft beer, your, your craft brewery will get to the point where you have to distribute it. And if you go to any a major grocery store and look at the beer section in there now, it looks like the wine section has 50 million different beers in there. Now you, you've got so much competition. The only way you can grow or get, be more competitive is to get some capital investment in your distribution channels. And the only way to do that is the... It's interesting. This is an interesting debate because I've had people make arguments on both sides that I actually agree with. I don't know what the answer is because I've had someone say, so at what point are we able to take any of our companies or brands and get them to the point of IPO or getting, getting them to be the point where they're a Fortune 500 company. Yeah, can we do it as black people? Can we just, without using the major uh, big businesses, are we able to do that for our own black businesses and not have them have to sell to these major corporations to become viable in the major market? So is it possible? So I start to think about this, right? So, and I guess it depends upon the industry too. Because when I look at say, um, like the beverage industry, companies get to a certain point and it's either you're selling a Coke or Pepsi. Because if you don't, they're going to put money behind putting you out anyway. Right? Yeah, so those two, those two titans are so big that they have the capital to, okay, either you're going to get down or lay down. That's what it all boils down to. That's right. So, I, so my MBA is coming out now. So you, these industries, these major industries have deliberately put up barriers to entry for small businesses. They've, they've got a whole, they're playing chess. They specifically are doing things to make it more difficult to you. Their pricing strategies make it difficult for a company that's doing things on a smaller scale to, to sell that same product at the same price that they do. And they deliberately put those barriers up for you. They make things more difficult. They, they patent technologies that you can't have access to unless you pay them. So they deliberately put up these barriers so that you can't compete. So what, what, well, I guess what I'm saying is if you're going into a market and you expect to grow and you would like to grow, Grow into a market where those entry barriers are already not there. Create something new. Create something unique that doesn't exist. Now, that will also make you more attractive for these larger businesses. You create something that's unique that doesn't already exist, it'll make you more attractive. But if you, if you sell that business and you go open up a bank and start a movie channel and a real estate company like Robert Johnson did, I think you succeeded because now you can empower people even more. Yeah, I do too. Like I, I've seen people um, with the criticism, and I think with his situation, I think it just it seemed a little crazier because it was called Black Entertainment Television. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> 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 I think the naming of his company had a lot to do with his criticism. Yeah, that, that sent people rubbed them the wrong way. Yeah, yeah that's I, true. But I did see the moves that he made, like post BET, and like you said, when you have a real estate investment trust, which is publicly traded, I think the ticker is RLJ. Um, you know, he has a bank. Um, he had a, a fleet of car dealerships, so he put the money back to work. I also remember the brother uh, who had the, I think it was the Shea Moisture Company or something, which was yep. black. He just sold to the major, uh, the major distributor for that because they was basically they, they gave him the get down to lay down. But what like he, they, did, yeah. 
what he did was he took a hundred million, he put it up in a fund for women of color to start businesses. He's going to like fund them. Um, I think he also went and resurrected Essence Magazine. So I guess it also depends upon what you do with the capital you get yeah. to sell the business. I just, it's a, a yeah. business is a, a business is a vehicle. We, we, I mean, if, if you can make money through a business and create value and then somebody decides they want to pay you for that value, take that money. Don't take the money and run it. Take the money and reinvest it. I mean, do it, do something else with it. But just because that person sold a business, it's not emotional when it comes to business. It's yeah, but it's emotional when it comes to the customers because the thing about a lot of the black owned businesses is that people frequent those businesses because they were black owned. And now when you sell them to somebody that's not black owned, you lose some of that frequency to, you know, to the, to the marketing, you know, as you can't market yourself as a black owned business anymore. I, I just, agree. Yeah. I just think it's an interesting conversation because honestly, I just don't know what the answer is because I, like I've, I'm also, I also went to business school and I remember a professor telling me that, you know, it, you got to take the emotion out of it and all businesses are meant to be sold at some point or another. But, but he also didn't come from where I come from when, when I see how all of those black businesses are the ones who employ people that look like them. So it, you're, you're talking about the politics and, and, and everything start to blend with the business. So it's not as simple as just, you know, you, you, you create a business just to sell it. It's a little deeper than that when it comes to black owned business. It's a, you get into the politics of it, you'll, you'll wrap yourself around the axle and never achieve what your ultimate goal is. Because I, I mean, I've gotten grief for brewing beer. Like a lot of, a lot of, a lot of believe it or not, a lot of people in the black community don't drink alcohol. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's a, it's a lot of people think that we do, but a lot of people don't. And a lot of people won't buy my spice mixes because it's associated with my beer. Yeah. I've had people tell me that specifically, like, and I'm like, yeah, I, 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 I think about that too. I, you know, like if if if, 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 if Budweiser comes tomorrow and they want to run an ad on our show, do we just say yes or do we say, take a pause back, or is it like, yo, this is business, right? <laughs> so, so let me ask you, Robert. Like, yeah, Budweiser comes tomorrow and says we want to buy Brew and Feed, your whole brand, your spices, everything, and we want to give you a hundred million. How long will it take you to make your decision? At this stage of the game. I would take the money and go start another business. <laughs> I'm not far enough along. Now there, there are some people, there are some craft. That's my personal thing is I'm not far enough along, but in this business, it's a lifestyle brand. I would have built a community around this when I get it to where I want it to be. And I'll have people that I go to conferences with and do things with that. I have a relationship with there's big brands. You ever heard of Sierra Nevada brewing company? Yeah, uh, Dogfish Head Brewing Company. Yep. These Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, the guy that owns it is a billionaire, and his his business, as far as revenue, is a rounding error on AB InBev or, or AB InBev spreadsheets. He wouldn't even show up on the on the on the mark, but he's a billionaire, and he said he would never sell his company. Now it's easy for him to say because he's now a billionaire. Yeah. Um, but. I think it has a lot to do with the community that's built around. There's a lot of very large independent craft brewers that will probably never sell their craft beer brand to AB InBev because it's ingrained in their lifestyle. Now, th- as these folks get older, if they don't have a successor, it's more likely that they would sell their business because they don't have a successor. And it's like, I can only do this for so- at some point I got to retire. Yeah, we talk a lot about that when we, when we talk to the young people um, about succession planning, um, about, uh, time is not, time doesn't end when your time ends. And it, time ends, you know, it, it's about lineage, you know, about thinking outside your lifespan. So uh, what are you doing as far as um, setting up a successor for your business? Yeah. Oh, so I, I like I said, I'm still in the early stages of it. Um, and I don't know if I have, I don't have any kids. I got nephews. Um, but I haven't even thought about that yet because I'm still so early stage right now. You don't have a succession plan just yet because you haven't finished building it out. And no, it's still I mean, a business and it's still running. I'm pretty sure it makes some income. So, you know, you might want to, you know, put that. He's being humble, too. He's being humble. You, you can yeah. go to all his uh, sites and, and see what he's got going on. No, no, listen. I, I, I look, when you sent me the feeds, I, I went and looked. Look that. You know what though? I know why. Because you, you're looking at what's in the marketplace, and you're trying to get to a certain point. So I understand why you talk that way. But you know, you got to sometimes pat yourself on the back of what you've already accomplished. But I know you're 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 trying to get to that hundred million dollar valuation. I understand like what you're working towards. Well, so honestly, my my whole thing is 
I don't, I know I'm statistical, right? So statistically, the there's, a gla- the the there's, a, there's a glass ceiling in the corporate world, right? There's only so many executives that look like me. I very rarely run into somebody when I'm in these executive meetings that look like me. So statistically, it might be difficult for me to get to where I want to get to mm-hmm. before I retire out of this career field. Mm-hmm. So I need a wedge, right? I need something that says, when I get to a point where I've succeeded all I can succeed and whatever biases or whatever it is, it might be a barrier to my success in the corporate world. I want, I want a, I want brewing fee to have significant amount of revenue already being generated. So if I leave this full-time job and I can put more energy into brewing fee, I can then explode it out and make it bigger than what it is while I'm still working. Yeah. And, and we know it's a, a lot longer, but I did want to bring up something else as well. Right. Um, I think it's a valid point because I, I see these debates also, uh, you know, in, in, in my circle in terms of entrepreneurship and just going full head on versus keeping your job while you're building something on the side. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've seen it work both ways. Like I've literally seen people keep their job, build something on the side and that thing on the side actually starts to create more revenue than their job. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So, um, I think that it's interesting that you were able to build what you built while still maintaining your corporate job because, like I said, all of your content is quality. You have products and your labeling are quality. Like, you have a quality operation. And I can tell just by looking at what you have going on, what you're trying to do. So, you, so appearance matters to you. You're trying to, you know, um, I guess a good analogy would be Apple. Like, when you get an Apple phone, the one thing they have over everyone is the appearance. Like, their boxes are set a certain way. Mm-hmm. Something in the plastic is different than someone else. That's right. <laughs> I'm not even an Apple fan, but I use both platforms. So, you know, um, but I'm just saying that, that to say that you're, you've put a lot into what you've built thus far. But yeah. You've also been able to maintain your gear. And, you know, just to let people out there know, if you're thinking about getting a business or buying investments or whatever it may be, it's okay with keeping your job and building that on the side, right? There's a lot of hours in the day and you just have to be efficient with those hours, right? That's right. And I don't, I don't sleep a lot. So <laughs> it helps. <laughs> it helps not needing a lot of sleep. Um, but it, you do have to spend some time with it. You got to kind of set some time aside on the weekends, after hours, after work. Um, but don't try to do it all at once. Like I said, I'm pacing myself. I'm doing a little bit here, a little bit there. And the good thing about it is I may have a plan to do something and I might start doing it. I'm like, I'm not feeling this. and I just go do something else because it's mine. I can set my own priorities and do it based on what I think is the right thing to do. Yeah. So yeah, I, I've, I'm doing it all on my own. Everything I built, the website you see, I built that, all of the content I create, all of the, everything, pretty much it's all me. That's yeah. why I did the clone video because I wanted to represent that it's me, myself and I are doing this, but relationships though. I got, I got good relationships with folks in the craft beer community to help me with some of this stuff. So you've given us a lot of gems this episode. For one, about your networking, about asking questions, about outsourcing, about managing your time, about, you know, so I can go on and on with all the gems that you've gotten, but I definitely appreciate your time. Yeah. You know, appreciate your knowledge and wisdom and, and I'm looking forward to seeing where you build this thing out as you continue to grow because I want to see when you have to make that decision whether you're selling or not. Robert, give us, <laughs> Robert, Robert, give us, give us, give us, a, give us a couple books that you read. Oh man, oh some man! Your, this, some of your favorite. Give us something that's one of your favorite books, or something either favorite or something you think that you know is not one of the more popular ones. Either or. I listen to a lot of audio books. Um, I, I just picked up one called The Prince. Um, it's it's about the history of land ownership and how princes were made to go out and uh, run countries. Um, that's a good one. Um, I listen to some of the craft beer books and how they were made. I listen to the Sierra Nevada book. He talks about his, how he started his business. He started out as a distributor first, then he became a brewery, and then he already had the knowledge laid on how to distribute his beer, kind of like what I'm doing with laying the groundwork and then mm-hmm. the next step. Um, Dogfish Head has another beer, a book that they did. It talks about the business of brewing and all the, the stuff that they went through. Um, uh, was a, I, I listen to a lot of science books, man. I listen to a lot of stuff about physics okay. um, because – Everything we do is about physics, about overcoming the ability to distributing product, making product. It's all about moving product. 
Um, so I listen to a lot of, I read a lot and listen to a lot of books about physics and science and stuff like that. That's interesting. So you're, you're the first business person to actually bring that up, like uh, books about physics, right? And it, yeah. you know, it's all related. I know a lot of uh, business people love math, but Corey loves math. He thinks everything yeah. is math. That's my that's, move. So, so yeah. he, he says everything is math. You say everything is physics. And I, I guess that's kind of one of the same. You can make that argument. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all related. Yeah, it's all related. Okay, so the, uh, what's the first one? It's the Prince, though. I've never heard of that one. Yes, yeah, like it's, 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 it's a very interesting book that, was t that talks about how to... It's very devious in a way because it's about... Land ownership was it back in the day, way back in the day. It, you own land or you was a peasant. There was no other, there was nothing in between. And then and if you did own land, you were basically leasing that land from someone because they let you lease that land. And then they would put a prince in charge of that kingdom and that prince would basically run that kingdom and that he would be basically, if he started screwing up, they would get rid of him and put another prince in there. It's an amazing book about the history of wealth Okay. And it'll, it'll give you a linkage into wealth and why some people have it and some people don't. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm on that right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're going to have to. like we're on our way back that way anyway in terms of uh, history repeating itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. So, so listen, a lot of gems. Um, you know, you gave us a couple books, some, some craft brewery books, and the print sounds like the one I'm going to go jump on right away. Yeah, I'm going to hit that. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, man. Listen, thank you for your time, man. Much success to you in the future. Um, we're going to put the links to see what you got going on social media wise, as well as your website. Um, good luck with all the products that you released. Uh, I hope you get your, tra all your trademarks that you apply for. <laughs> yeah. Right? I got some more coming. Yeah, it's good. To see, it's good to see someone that looks like me. Um, you know, and you're from East Cleveland, man. So like yeah. I said, I've already heard about East Cleveland, man. That's not, it's not easy to, to get out of East Cleveland, man. You know, yeah. <laughs> um, but congratulations, man. And, and again, thank you. I'll have, you know, our listeners, please go check out and see what Rob's got going on. Um, there are people like us that are in the craft brewing industry, believe it or not. So, um, Corey, anything you want to say before we got here? Yeah, I, he, he dropped a million gems in this, in this podcast, in this video. So, if, however you're consuming this, you need to take your pen and pencil out and, and go back through this video and, and, and capture all those gems that our man Rob dropped on us today. Yeah, all right, thanks. Appreciate it. I'm Brewing Feed on all social media platforms except Twitter. I'm Feed Brew on Twitter. Uh, and much success for you on the podcast, man. I got it bookmarked, so I'll be listening. No doubt, man. Thank you, man. Listen, as we always say, people, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. It elevates, and we'll see you guys on top. Peace. Peace. Peace.